Thank you for attending Mayor Andrew J. Ginther's State of the City Address. Please rise for the presentation of colors and continue standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave? O'er the land of the free and the home of the You may be seated. Please welcome Rita Smith, historian and founding board chair of the James Preston Poindexter Foundation. I'm a little shorter. Good evening, everyone. We are, I am so honored to welcome each and every one of you who have been brave enough to come out on this cold evening to hear our mayor, Mayor Andrew Grither's, oops, 2019 city address this, this evening. And we are here in the historic East High School and the home of the Tigers. And I know there's some East High folks out there. <laughs> I am Rita Smith, 
the, the historian and founding chairperson for the James Preston Poindexter Foundation. And I would love to welcome each and, as I said, each and every one of you, but I'd like to give a special recognition to all of our elected officers, our dignitaries, and our special friends, and of course, all of our sponsors. Thank you. Um, I would like to take a special moment also uh, to, to give a special shout out, shout out to our public employees. You know, with situations that have been going on the last few weeks, but we want to give them a special thought and a, pre a moment of appreciation for their dedication and commitment for all they do to keep us safe and prosperous with my, all the services they perform. So with my deepest gratitude. So we, they, we are so grateful. Those folks that are keeping those streets safe, that ice and being out there in that cold weather, they're just super uh, persons. We are looking forward to the mayor's report and vision for the future of our city this evening. We are so pleased that the mayor has understood that the stability of our neighborhoods is the foundation of a great city. Those neighborhoods that have not always been supported in the past are now receiving his and his team full uh, attention. Even though, you know, we as citizens may not always agree but the mayor's office and his staff and, and our city officials have respected the concerns of all of our citizens. But you know, they have me as a historian and so they know I'm gonna tell a little history. So I have a couple of points I'd like to share with you this evening. But first, we are so thankful that we are preserving a part of the Afro-American history by the saving of the two historic remaining buildings in Poindexter Village. And with the city's cooperation and with, in partnership with the Ohio History Connection, we are developing a museum and cultural learning center that will celebrate the lives of many of our past citizens, with uh, Afro-American citizens that helped to make this city a, a great city to be in. And after 10 years, now it only took two, 10 years to get to this point, um, but the city and all of our elected, many of our elected off, uh, persons and staff persons have listened to us and we are so eternally grateful because it made a difference. And I see some folks right down there that were really instrumental in helping us do that. Thank you. But also, another example uh, of honoring uh, persons of importance to us is that the renaming a part of High Street is known now as Rosa Parks Way, which is remembering <laughs> those, who's, oh, who, those whose shoulders we all stand. We didn't get here by ourselves. Somebody came before us. But secondly, again, remember I'm a historian, we still have as our mission remembering and putting a value on the rich history and story of Columbus, Ohio. And our story began with Luca Sullivan who had a vision for our community in the 1780s. That's over 200 years ago. And it was his vision for a city to be built on the banks of the Scioto River. Now Franklinton, and can you imagine that Benjamin Franklin would be so proud to know that his name was a part of our beginnings. Columbus has always been a symbol of hope. 
But, and there's always a but in there, we have lost so many of our small jewels that represent that sense of hope. And remembering is so important. And if you may recall, in the book of Joshua, the Israelites were told to leave those 12 stones on the banks of the River Jordan so that the future generations would ask, what happened here? And the story would be recounted. We must preserve our places and tell our stories. So, like the original pioneer, Mr. Sullivan's character had foresight and his resourceful nature made it possible for future generations, us, to survive and prosper. His courage, like the innovations and visions held by our Mayor Ginther, who loves Columbus and whom we love, will share the next chapter, which will, well, will, which will become our future story. So I say, welcome to the Mayor's 2019 State of the City Address, and where Columbus is a symbol of hope and in, the God, in, in God's plan, it's a place where the impossible become possible. Thank you. I am Columbus. 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 Én is Columbus vagyok. Columbus Bonahai. I am Columbus. 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 Please welcome the mayor of the city of Columbus, Mayor Andrew J. Ginther. Thank you and good evening. What a great night in the city of Columbus. I am Columbus and so are you. Wasn't that video amazing? All the different faces, places, voices that make our city great. I'm constantly amazed at the diversity of the residents of this great city. Almost 250,000 residents are African American. 103,000 are foreign born. 53,000 are Latinos. 41,000 are veterans. 38,000 identify as LGBTQ. Our population continues to get younger. The median age is 32. But more than 65,000 children under the age of five and more than 86,000 senior citizens also call Columbus home. We are all neighbors, and we are all part of the fabric that is Columbus. In the summers following my sophomore and junior year at Earlham College, I was blessed with the opportunity to serve in consecutive internships at the Carter Center in Atlanta. I was also fortunate to meet one of my heroes, President Jimmy Carter. As you know, President Carter is a pretty smart, and decent man. Graduated from the Naval Academy, served on nuclear submarines, and established a successful post-presidential career rooted in service. 
we could all learn a thing or two from him. I'll never forget the advice he gave to me on one hot June day in the basement of Mariantha Methodist Church. Eight or so interns and I had left Atlanta to go be with him as he still teaches Sunday school at his Baptist church there. But Mrs. Carter grew up in the Methodist church and they were doing a fundraiser for their youth group. So we went over there for the spaghetti lunch and it's a moment in time I won't ever forget. Here's the former leader of the free world collecting our paper plates and cleaning off the table from his wife, us, and the Secret Service agent still assigned to him. And of course, bringing Mrs. Carter the biggest piece of dessert he could find. President Carter knew that I was interested in politics and public service. And he said, always make sure when you have the most difficult decisions to make that are gonna impact people's lives, be secure enough and smart enough to surround yourself with the most talented people and listen to them, take their counsel, but stand by the decision you make. And with those words in mind, I would like to thank my very bright cabinet and my outstanding staff, especially my chief of staff, Ken Paul. I'd also like to thank my wife, Shannon, and my daughter. The commitment to lead a city is one that affects our entire family every day. And I'm grateful to you for sharing this journey with me. Columbus, you've elected some pretty smart people that serve as our partners in leading our great city. Columbus City Council President Shannon Harden, Council President Pro Tem, for a little while longer, Michael Stenziano, Council Members Elizabeth Brown, Mitch Brown, Emmanuel Remy, and Priscilla Tyson. And I would also like to acknowledge and welcome the newest City Council Member, Ms. Shayla Faber. Thank you to our great city attorney, Zach Klein, and our city auditor, Megan Kilgore. Thank you to the clerk of courts, Lori Tyak, for being here tonight. I'd also like to thank our incredible partners at Franklin County, our commissioners led by President Marilyn Brown, Kevin Boyce, and John O'Grady. And a very special thank you. I used to call her the best and baddest congresswoman in all of America, but now I call her Madam Chair. She was recently named chair of the Financial Services Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Congresswoman Beatty was instrumental in helping us land the Smart Cities Grant and the HUD Grant for Near East Side Development. Joyce Beatty, we're lucky to have you fighting for us in Washington. Now I'd like all our elected officials to stand so we can recognize you for your service. Please, members of the bench and the school board and state representatives, and let's give them all a round of applause for their service. A few more thank yous for those who started us off this evening. I don't know about you, but I thought my sticker was just fantastic from the Gay Men's Chorus for singing the national anthem. Our outstanding police and fire color guard for presenting the colors. Our Columbus Police Explorers for being our volunteers and ushers this evening. And to my wonderful friend, the incredible Rita Smith, for that incredible welcome. I always learn something when I'm with Rita Smith, and I'm grateful she's here tonight. And to the principal, Charles Richardson, and assistant principal, Martha Howe, here at East High School, thank you for welcoming us to your house tonight. And as I promised, Senator Craig and Commissioner Boyce, this whetstone brave will leave before nightfall. <laughs> I stand before you having served three years as your mayor. And what an incredible three years it has been. 
Tonight I will share with you our accomplishments, where we are now as a city, then my bold plans for the future. Columbus continues to have the fastest growing economy in the Midwest, and we are the driver of the economy in the state of Ohio. It seems like every week Columbus is recognized for something, whether it's by Time Magazine, Forbes, or the Human Rights Campaign. We landed the Smart Cities Challenge Grant, putting us on the cutting edge of mobility. Columbus was also named one of Bloomberg's winning cities in the American Cities Climate Challenge that will help us meet, or if I know our community, beat our near-term carbon reduction goals and improve the quality of life for our residents. Because of Stephanie Hightower, we hosted the National Urban League for their annual conference, the nation's largest annual civil rights conference last August. And this year, we'll host the American Society of Association Executives, the Super Bowl of annual meetings. It's expected to have a $500 million economic impact over the next decade. And I don't know about you, but did any of you catch the NCAA Women's Final Four last March? Not only was it phenomenal basketball, it was a flawlessly planned and executed major event. Anytime as a mayor you can go to bed on Sunday night and ESPN is saying, the best Final Four ever, when are we coming back to Columbus? You know you've done it right. So to Linda Logan, the Sports Commission and Experience Columbus, they deserve a big round of applause for their incredible work. In my previous State of the City addresses, I committed to make Columbus America's opportunity city, to tackling our most pressing challenges and making tangible, long-lasting changes to lift up Columbus neighborhoods and move our city forward together. We have, and we are, and I am proud to tell you tonight the state of our city is strong. <clears throat> Many of you have heard me say that my top three priorities are neighborhoods, neighborhoods, neighborhoods. This city's made significant investments in time and resources in Linden. Between 1960 and 2010, the population of Linden decreased from 26,000 to 18,000. The median household income is less today than it was two decades ago. And infant mortality rates were twice as high in Linden as anywhere else in Franklin County. But we all know Linden is a proud community with a rich history. But we knew that revitalizing this great neighborhood would not be simple. And we knew that we could not restore this community to greatness without listening to and serving the residents of Linden. In October, we rolled out One Linden, a community-driven master plan to address transportation housing, retail and small business, health and safety, education and workforce. What is different about this plan from all others is that it was created by the community for the community. People like Peggy Williams were instrumental in this work. Miss Peg, as she is known in the neighborhood, is a lifelong resident of Linden. She's a homeowner, works at a child care center, and is a graduate of the United Way Neighborhood Leadership Academy. Ms. Pegg knows the challenges of this neighborhood. She lives with them. But she also lives with optimism for the future of her community. She was actively involved in the planning process and continues to contribute her time, energy, and ideas as we move forward together to implement the One Linden Plan. Ms. Pegg, would you stand so we could recognize you? Thank you. 
Earlier this week, we lost a giant in the Linden community with the passing of Clarence Lumpkin, who was affectionately known as the mayor of Linden. Quick story, I was a very new member of the Board of Education at a pretty heated community meeting at Lyndon McKinley High School. Mr. Lumpkin had a very different opinion uh, of a position that I was taking. Hightower remembers this, and uh, Mr. Lumpkin uh, let me have it publicly, called me out. And it was a moment for me to realize what I was focused on and how it was gonna impact everybody. A couple months later, he walked up to me and said, you know, Ginther, you were right. But I wanted to see if you were tough enough to follow through and do what needed to be done. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize his decades of service to his community and offer my prayers for his family and all who knew him. Mr. Lumpkin made me a better public servant and made Columbus a better city. Godspeed, Mr. Lumpkin. Our commitment to Linden has not come at the expense of other neighborhoods. We continue to make investments all across our great city. On the hilltop, we opened the Glenwood Recreation Center and invested in the newest Boys and Girls Club in the Jay Ashburn Center. And, just like Linden, our Department of Neighborhoods and the Neighborhood Design Center are now in the process of creating a master plan for the hilltop with the residents. In Driving Park, we reopened a state-of-the-art community recreation center complete with a pool, weight room, and community rooms to promote the health and well-being of the entire neighborhood. And on the south side, we, in partnership, helped build more than 200 affordable housing units, both at the Career Gateway Center and Parsons Village for our seniors. We also partnered with Community Development for All People to help open the All People's Fresh Market on Parsons, offering residents free produce. In Franklinton, the city contributed to the opening of Jubilee Market a nonprofit grocery store that is serving residents on the west side. The Rich and River Development and the Gravity Project are near completion, and the new projects are on the horizon, will help incorporate affordable housing options and help us maintain and create more mixed income neighborhoods. In Northland, Huntington Bank opened a new office complex that houses over 1,400 employees. And they also doubled down on their commitment to Columbus neighborhoods by investing $300 million in loans for low to moderate income residents. In Milo Grogan, affordable housing has been created by Homeport. Jobs in the hundreds have come to Rogue Fitness, and Coda C Max has had a real impact on moving people in and around the neighborhood. In the Wagner Grove neighborhood on the far east side, we broke ground on a state-of-the-art fire station that will be completed this year. And in Lizelle Woods, one of our fastest growing communities to the north, we began construction on a new police substation. And throughout Columbus neighborhoods, with the support of city council, we've demolished blighted and abandoned properties. And we've spent record resources to pave streets, improve sidewalks, and traffic signals, and continue to provide residents with clean drinking water. All of this contributes to the overall well-being of our residents. Studies show that early childhood education is the foundation of lifelong learning and a predictor of future success. Since 2016, we've increased the opportunity for children we serve each year by 33%. In September of 2017, the Champion Avenue location of the Columbus Early Learning Centers welcomed a young girl named Myla. On our first day of pre-K, she was shy and a little nervous. 
She had a tough time engaging with her new classmates and was only able to identify six letters of the alphabet. But by the next summer, Amila could identify, could identify all the letters of the alphabet, the sounds associated with them, and clap out syllables in words. And she had made a ton of friends. Children, like Amila, are why we prioritize high quality, early childhood education. And for all the providers in the audience and that are watching here tonight, we want to thank you for your dedication to our young people. But Amila's story is not an exception or a rare occurrence. And that's why the city's funding for Early Start Columbus is so important. That's why I've also charged Jane Leach, our executive director of Future Ready, to develop a regional plan for this community focusing on birth to five because the learning and socialization that happens at the earliest age has the most impact. I know that with the public and private partnerships that we can leverage in this community, we will become a national leader and a model in the birth to five space. Columbus worked hard to be named the nation's first smart city. It was awarded a $40 million grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation, along with $10 million from Paul G. Allen Philanthropies. But that was just the start. Since then, we have received commitments of almost $600 million in aligned investments by more than two dozen public and private sector organizations, such as the county, the state, AEP, Honda, AT&T. Last year, we released the Smart Columbus Operating System, the backbone of all of the work we are doing. And we moved into the Smart Columbus Experience Center along the Scioto Mile to show residents and visitors what a smart and connected city can look like. Our efforts to boost consum consumer adoption of electric vehicles is also paying off. Since 2017, electric vehicle registration has increased by 65%, outpacing the Midwest and the nation. And in 2017, we seated the Columbus Women's Commission, headed by First Lady Shannon Ginther. She is a passionate advocate for women's rights and is leading the effort to assure city policies are first and foremost fair and equitable. And this work isn't just limited to the public sector. Last year, the Women's Commission launched the Columbus Commitment, asking companies and organizations to pledge to learn about the gender pay gap, understand how race and other factors create even larger disparities, and most importantly, to take action, to build awareness of the unique challenges facing women in the workplace. At the start, we set the goal to enlist 50 companies, but since then, Almost 200 employers have signed that pledge to help alleviate gender and race-based inequalities. <laughs> Clearly, equality is the business of Columbus. I thank those who made the commitment and challenge those who have not yet to do so today. The Columbus Women's Commission has also played a vital role in helping reduce the city's eviction rate. It's the seventh highest in all of America. Evictions disproportionately affect women, particularly African American women in our community. And because of the commission's work, the Self-Help Resource Center was relocated right outside eviction court, making it easier for women who are on the verge of homelessness to access services that can prevent eviction. In just the fourth quarter of 2018, they served more families 
than in 2016 and 2017 combined. That is a small change with a big impact. And earlier this year, with the leadership of city council, we amended city codes to limit retaliatory evictions in which a landlord files an eviction notice against a tenant as retribution for complaints about the condition of their housing. I want to thank Columbus City Council for their leadership and commitment to tackling this challenge. As a city, we must confront discrimination and inequality wherever we find it and work to create a culture of inclusiveness where promoting diversity is at the heart of every decision we make. All of our work is built on the foundation of trust with the community. The first two executive orders I signed focused on transparency and inclusion. And I believe that diversity and inclusion begins at the top. That's why women and people of color comprise more than half of my cabinet and staff. I'm also proud to say that I have a liaison to the LGBTQ community, both in my cabinet and on my staff. Don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you believe. The success of our Office of Diversity and Inclusion extends beyond my office and other city employees. In 2017, we saw a 50% increase in city spending with minority and women-owned businesses a sign that our strategies are working. Our strategies are working, and they're working for companies like Keep It Clean Window Cleaning. The owners of Keep It Clean were introduced and certified with the City of Columbus in early 2018. They worked with our Business Opportunity Assessment Program that assists companies' capacity building needs. They have since been awarded their first major contract with the city. Owners Daryl Lee and Michael Winfield told us, Winkfield told us that through this, they've been able to build their business and keep people working. Daryl and Michael, if you're here, will you please stand? Diversity and inclusion must be a part of all that we do as a city. While we have much work left to do, we owe a debt of great gratitude to our Columbus Police Chief, Kim Jacobs, who broke the glass ceiling and made increasing diversity a priority for the division. Chief Jacobs has also set standards in implicit bias, training for officers that received national recognition. Establish diversity and inclusion officer positions to better serve communities of color, new Americans, Muslims, and the LGBTQ community. She led the city in signing on to the One Mind campaign to improve police response to people affected by mental illness and made crisis intervention training mandatory for all recruits. Chief Jacobs, would you stand so we could recognize you for your service? In 2016, I said that we would adopt body-worn cameras as another tool for keeping police and the public safe. Our $10 million investment has helped solve crimes and protect residents and our officers. Columbus has also led the way in developing the policies and guidelines for how body cameras are used, serving as the model for state legislation passed by the Ohio General Assembly and signed by the governor in December. In December. I want to offer my thanks to Senator Herschel Craig for championing this legislation. Senator, thank you. thank you.
2017, we faced a record homicide rate. And I knew we needed a different approach. We couldn't simply police our way out of the spike in homicides. We held a series of small group meetings with residents across the city. We developed the comprehensive neighborhood safety strategy, a broad-based approach that engaged law enforcement, every city department, businesses, faith and community leaders, and residents to help reduce crime. We expanded the Safe Street Spike Patrol from Linden to the Hilltop and to the South Side. Not only did it help reduce crime, Linden alone saw a 19% drop in gun violence just last summer. It also helped build police and community relations. And I heard from residents and police officers alike who told me time and again how much they loved the program because it made officers more accessible and helped them strengthen ties with the community. The neighborhood safety strategy also includes coordinated efforts to create physical deterrence to crime such as cleaning area alleyways of trash and installing pedestrian lighting and sidewalks. Neighborhood liaisons, area commissioners, and residents work together to solve nuisance code violations. And we passed the most comprehensive local gun laws in Ohio to keep the hands out of the wrong, keep guns out of the wrong hands of people in our community. And while we continue to push the state to finally pass common sense gun laws that protect our families and first responders. Last year's crime statistics show we are moving in the right direction. As of December 31st, the homicide rate dropped by 28%, and violent crime continues to trend down. The Columbus Community Safety Advisory Commission is another key component of our comprehensive strategy that will have long-lasting effects on policing in our city. 17 residents have been charged with reviewing and recommending best practices to ensure the Columbus Division of Police has the best training, policies, and procedures to protect and serve the entire community. The Commission has been meeting regularly and working with Matrix, an independent consultant, to present recommendations by this spring. Their work will also help to inform us as we launch a national search for the next Chief of Police. I know the work has not been easy. The conversations at times have been spirited. But I want to thank the Commission, and particularly Chair Janet Jackson, for their leadership and their commitment. And I look forward to your recommendations. As I said, we're conducting a national search for the next chief of police because the people of Columbus and our police officers deserve the very best, whether that person comes from inside or outside the division. My deputy chief of staff, Don Tyler Lee, will head up that process, and it will include robust community engagement. Earlier this month, we enacted historic campaign finance reforms. They create new, cutting-edge, dark money disclosure to make sure municipal elections are decided by the people, not by special interest dollars. In addition, this legislation establishes the first campaign finance limits in the city's history and expands access to our elections with new tax credits for small donations. I'm grateful to Columbus City Council for taking up this charge. The city's ability to provide core city services, like snow removal and police and fire service, is dependent on income tax. It represents almost 80% of our revenue for basic city services. 
I'm pleased to report that since 2016, we've created 7,000 new jobs across many industries in the city of Columbus. Our positive business culture has resulted in two privately held startup companies obtaining $1 billion valuations. Root Insurance and Cover My Meds, homegrown, leading the way in the business community around the country and the world. We've also been able to streamline the building process. We continue to move more permitting online. In 2018, 70% of permits were issued online, improving timelines and increasing efficiencies for the city and our customers. The construction trade is booming in Columbus, everywhere we look. And so we're leveraging that boom to get more people into the building construction trades as lifetime careers with good benefits. In 2017, in partnership with Columbus City Schools, we established the Columbus Building Construction Trades Community Benefits Fund to offer scholarships for Columbus residents enrolled in apprenticeship programs. To date, we have enrolled 500 people in apprenticeship programs, and more than one-third of them are women, minorities, and people from low-income neighborhoods. Columbus continues to invest, receive billions of dollars in investments in our traditional strength sectors like finance and insurance. Our hospitals and medical centers are now creating the next generation of industry, such as gene therapy. Nationwide Children's Hospital in Ohio State are on the cutting edge, and they're helping to create companies that save lives. Pillar Technologies is another great Columbus success story, drawing top technology talent and helping with one of the city's biggest initiatives, Smart Columbus. Pillar started in 1996. We've transformed over the last several years to who we are today. Today we're a custom software development shop that companies, mostly Fortune 100 companies, come to uh, with their hardest problems for us to solve. Our focus is in custom software development. We bring digital projects to life. Automotives today is a big focus of ours. We're really focused on autonomous vehicles as well as some of the things going on in the smart city. The Pillar team is building what we call our Smart Columbus operating system, a cloud-based integrated data exchange that is truly the backbone and heartbeat of our smart city strategy. When you think about Amazon, they started off as a bookstore. No one knew what they would become today, and that's really where we're at with the smart city. Today, think of it as a bookstore. We're building the operating system, but where it's going to go is endless. There is a true passion among all the people at Pillar for what we're doing at Smart Columbus. They believe in the mayor's guiding principle that mobility is the great equalizer of the 21st century, and they are a major part of bringing that guiding principle to life every single day. Our people were very passionate about making Columbus great and finding those types of projects, so it was one of our initiatives to really have an opportunity to pitch to the city why Pillar was the choice and eventually winning that project is something we're very proud of. They call it Columbus Way, where everyone's kind of helping each other, is really powerful. We couldn't do what we're doing with Smart Columbus without Pillar doing the work that they're doing. Everybody really here wants to win. Starts with the Buckeyes and comes all the way down. I'm a little biased, but I'd like to point out that the man who brought Pillar to our city, Bob Myers, is a proud Columbus native and a Northland High School graduate. And Braves don't give shout outs to Vikings every day. I'm excited about the work that Pillar is doing with Smart Columbus and where we are headed. Columbus is experiencing tremendous growth. We lead the Midwest in job creation and Unemployment remains historically low. The jobs created in Columbus fuel the city's investment in Columbus neighborhoods. Since the Great Recession, sound fiscal management and an ongoing commitment to achieving greater efficiencies has allowed the city to reinvest 
into critical city services. In 2009, the city committed to achieving savings of $100 million by the end of the decade. And we more than doubled that goal in just five years. And last year, the city launched a citywide operations review to identify additional efficiencies and make recommendations on how to best position the city for future growth while maintaining high quality services. None of the reforms made in recent years, nor the ones we will make in the months and years ahead, would be possible without the strong partnerships we've built with organized labor. Through the collective bargaining process, our labor unions help secure the future of Columbus while assuring fair wages, benefits, and working conditions for their membership. Would all the labor leaders in the room please stand so we can recognize you. Last year, the population in our region grew by 40,000 people, and more than half of that was within the city limits of Columbus. So the city is strong, and our future looks bright. But while two-thirds of our residents are doing very well, a third of our neighbors still struggle to make ends meet. And as our city grows, we are not immune from some of the challenges facing our peer cities. As it is true across our nation, opioid addiction continues to ravage our neighborhoods. In 2017, we announced the Franklin County Opiate Task Force that partnered the city, the county, and other entities to fight this disease that threatens family and neighborhood stability every day. We launched REACT, the Rapid Response Emergency Addiction and Crisis Team that coordinates a medic and a social worker to follow up with people who have overdosed on opioids. In 2018, the first full year of the program, we recorded nearly 3,000 ESMS calls in which naloxone, a medication that rapidly reverses opioid overdose, was administered. Of those patients, more than 1,000 were admitted for addiction treatment. That means more than 1,000 people, brothers and sisters, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters, had another chance to fight the relapsing brain disease that is addiction. Columbus also helped pave the way with so many other partners for the opening of the Mary Haven Addiction Stabilization Center on the south side to relieve pressure on hospital emergency rooms and provide more chances for recovery. Earlier this year, Dr. Mashika Roberts in Columbus Public Health was charged with leading our collective efforts to reduce opioid addiction because the opioid addiction epidemic is clearly a public health crisis. There's still much work to do. And I look to Dr. Roberts and Columbus Public Health and all of our community partners to make progress in this area. Infant mortality, especially in the African American community, remains a complex problem without simple solutions. It was back in 2013, I was a pretty new city council president and had been contemplating with other leaders in the community what I was going to do with this new office and title, this role of influence in our community, what was I going to do with it? In 2013 it was actually on my daughter's birthday. I was asked to speak in an event at the Lincoln Theater held by the Ohio Equity Institute. I asked to go early on the agenda so I could meet up with Shannon and Clara for a birthday ice cream. It was in that meeting I was shocked, stunned, and moved to act that 150 babies were dying in Franklin County each year before their first birthday. And African American babies were two times more likely than white babies to die. 
So as I was on my way to my daughter's third birthday, I thought of the moms and dads who were never going to be able to celebrate their child's first birthday. And that's when I was called to act. I committed myself to help leading the reduction of infant mortality in Columbus. Celebrate One is vital to Columbus because we are a unique coalition of partners who have come together to help all babies thrive. And that means helping new parents, helping expected parents and expecting mothers, and girls who are not yet even thinking about having a pregnancy yet. We wanna make sure everyone has a healthy pregnancy and that every baby lives, not only to their first birthday, but every year beyond. Celebrate One helped me in multiple ways. They made sure I had doctor's appointments. They gave me referrals to get pack and play for baby when he was born because I didn't have a crib. We have been really successful over the last three years and trained over 1,500 safe sleep ambassadors in our community. We have also given out over the last three years over 3,000 pack and plays, uh, which are portable cribs to families that are in need. Working with the two connectors that I had, Victoria and Delina, were awesome. They were calling and making sure I had everything I need. Not just about the baby, they would ask how I was feeling, how my day's going. It was amazing being able to have them on my team. Transportation is a key element for expecting mothers to make sure they make every appointment to ensure that they have not only a healthy pregnancy, but a healthy baby. I mean, transportation is a big issue because it's a struggle. Early on, Celebrate One worked to identify what were the challenges that expecting parents were facing around transportation. We have an opportunity in partnership with Smart Columbus to make this work better for parents uh, with the use of technology and a whole system that communicates to mom in real time about available resources, where to pick her up, uh, and complete the trip so that it makes it easy on mom. The Celebrate One had a challenge in the beginning of reducing infant mortality by 40% by the year 2020. The Celebrate One has very big goals of reducing infant mortality in our community. And thus far, we've seen progress. How do we adjust our system so that every pregnant mother and every baby has an equal chance to thrive? One of the ways we wanna do that is to make sure we have an authentic support team for mom. It's a great support system because not everyone has no one to support them like outside of here. So like Celebrate One was like a family to me. I'm grateful to Erica Clark Jones, Donna James, our past board chair, and Michael Fiorelli, our current board chair, and all of our health partners, sleep ambassadors, and home visitors for continuing the work of saving babies in Columbus. Every baby in every neighborhood deserves the chance to celebrate his or her first birthday and thrive in their earliest years of life. So what's next, Columbus? When you envision our city in the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, what do you see? I see an affordable city with dynamic, inclusive growth, mixed income neighborhoods that support family stability, and mobility that provides equity and improves the quality of life for all of our residents. And we will do it together, like we're doing with Celebrate One, and like we're doing with Smart Columbus, like we did to save the crew. Because we know that saving the crew was not just about keeping soccer in Columbus. It was about leveraging private partnerships for affordable housing, 
high paying jobs, and historic minority participation in the building of a new stadium and the new community sports park. We'll use the same collaborative, collective spirit to move us all forward together. As I said earlier, rolling out the One Linden plan was one of our great accomplishments last year, but now we're in the process of implementing it. One of the pillars of the plan involves stabilizing and expanding housing options. I'm pleased to announce that the Department of Neighborhoods in my office are meeting regularly with private developers who are working to reimagine what housing can look like in Linden. These developers, Crawford Hoying, Connect Realty, Kaufman Development, the Pizzuti Companies, and Wagenbrenner Development, share my enthusiasm for innovative ideas and are working with the city and the neighborhood and community leaders to focus on creating new single family homes and townhouses, as well as large and small commercial opportunities in the neighborhood. I'm excited by this collaboration and look forward to sharing new developments as our important work progresses. But we know our affordable housing needs reach well beyond Linden. We've made historic changes to a decades-long residential tax incentive policy. We've modernized how we award abatements and incentives to ensure growth in all of our opportunity neighborhoods. The new policies went into place this month, and we're already seeing interest from developers who are as committed to creating mixed income neighborhoods as I am. In addition, through the work of City Council, we've made it mandatory for businesses who receive incentives from the City of Columbus to offer a minimum of $15 an hour for its workers. People who work in Columbus, who make this city great, should be paid a living wage, period. Earlier this month, I announced a bond package for the May ballot that will bring $50 million, first ever, unprecedented, historic commitment to affordable housing. This money will be an investment allocated over several years and used in partnership with many other private and public agencies, including our partners at the county, the state, and private sector, and our suburban neighbors. Because affordable housing is a regional challenge, and I know this region is up for the challenge. We are also moving from a land bank to a land trust system by working closely with Central Ohio Community Improvement Corporation and Franklin County. A land trust will allow our neighborhoods and the neighbors that make them up to preserve affordability on a property permanently, allowing seniors and other residents who have made our neighborhoods so special the ability to stay in their homes. This evening, I'm excited to announce that the city is committing $3.8 million for a pilot project that the Land Trust will be undertaking in four areas of Columbus, Franklinton, the South Side, the Near East, and Wineland Park. Our funding will leverage more than $7.2 million in private investment for the construction of at least 30 homes, which will be built and sold this year. I want to recognize Council President Hardin for championing this initiative. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Affordability is just one pillar for the future of our great city. Equitable access to mobility is crucial too. It gives residents access to jobs, health care, 
child care, education, and things you and I might take for granted, fresh fruits and vegetables. If mobility is the great equalizer of the 21st century, let us leverage it for shared prosperity in all of our neighborhoods. Our Smart Columbus team will unveil the prenatal trip assistance project this summer in all eight of our opportunity neighborhoods. This app will help expectant mothers schedule rides as well as communicate with their doctors. In addition, the app will help them arrange rides to and from grocery stores and pharmacies so they can make sure they're getting the food and prescriptions they need for a healthy pregnancy. I'd like to recognize and thank Molina Healthcare and CareSource for being partners of Smart Columbus and bringing this project to life. Today, attempting a trip using three modes of transportation requires three different applications to plan each leg of the trip, and you have to pay for them each separately. That's why Smart Columbus will release a multimodal trip planning application this year. And by 2020, we will enhance this app to include a common payment system. The common payment system will ensure equitable access to all to a planned smart card option that will be loaded with cash for those users who are unbanked or just choose not to link their credit or debit cards to the system. Columbus is known for being smart and open, and that includes our approach to new mobility services such as dockless bikes and scooters. We will continue to welcome new innovative mobility service providers in this city as long as they agree to operate under our values and they structure those rooted in equity, access, and opportunity. Technology, use, and internet access have become an everyday necessity, whether it's for work, banking, healthcare, schoolwork, or just connecting with your neighborhood. We all need access to technology. All of our residents, regardless of income or neighborhood, deserve fast and reliable internet access. Digital, <laughs> digital inclusion is a top priority for me and the city because it is also about equity access and opportunity. Not only should every resident have access to the internet, they should have and understand technology and the relevancy to their daily lives. So this year, we will work with public and private partners to make an unprecedented and historic commitment to expand high-speed internet to all of our neighborhoods. We will develop a framework to enhance digital literacy training and work to remove barriers so every resident has an opportunity to be fully engaged in our digital community. Climate change impacts all of our lives, but our most vulnerable residents are already disproportionately affected. Our opportunity neighborhoods are hotter, hard to believe on a day like today. But especially you think of the last couple of years and the extreme heat events that we've seen. It costs more to live in our opportunity neighborhoods because of climate change. The residents of our city who can afford it the least are charged the most to live comfortably. That's not fair, and we're gonna address it in the city of Columbus. Sustainable Columbus is working with external partners and internally with key city departments to guide us in finding solutions. We're focusing on protecting natural resources, combating climate change, reducing waste, and engaging our residents to protect those most impacted. We're laying the foundation to transform the way we power 
municipal operations through renewable energy. Our division of power has committed to purchase at least 50% renewable energy to power city facilities by 2020. And to have an impact at a large scale, the entire community must rally together and change the way energy is generated, consumed, and conserved. We have the perfect opportunity for this with Bloomberg Philanthropies as part of the Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge. Let me be clear. Climate change is a social justice issue, and we are going to address it in the city of Columbus. <laughs> 2017, the city of Columbus, in partnership with the Construction Building Trades and the NAACP, entered into a community benefits agreement for the construction of fire station number 35. The agreement, the first of its kind in the history of our city, guarantees local workforce for a percentage of the project and record minority participation. The Community Benefits Agreement has been so successful that we're going to be using the same type of agreement for the rebuilding of the Linden Community Recreation Center and the Columbus Community Sports Park on the existing site of Moffray Stadium. Columbus workers deserve to be part of the building of their city. <laughs> Nationally, firms with fewer than 100 employees have the largest share of small business employment. And the same is true in Columbus. In fact, Columbus has almost 8,000 very small businesses. More than 80% of all our companies have 20 or fewer employees. Startups and small businesses aid family stabilization and encourage the growth of mixed income neighborhoods. But we also know that startups and small businesses face challenges such as accessing funds and technical or logistical problems. Through the work of consultant Next Street, we are conducting a small business ecosystem assessment. Just last week, we named an advisory committee made up of area small business and entrepreneurial leaders and other stakeholder groups. This summer, we will begin implementation of a multi-year action plan with the guiding principle that entrepreneurship does more than just create jobs. It betters neighborhoods and improves the quality of life of our residents. At my State of the City address in 2017, I announced the creation of the Hilltop Early Childhood Partnership to double the number of Hilltop children enrolled in quality early learning programs by 2020. Some would say, why the Hilltop? Well, they had the lowest number of children enrolled in high quality learning programs of anywhere in the city. If we want shared prosperity in every neighborhood, we have to increase access in neighborhoods throughout. One of the recommendations was the development of a new early learning facility on the hilltop to increase the capacity of quality programs. I'm happy to announce that through a collaboration with Doug Bohr, Michael Redd, Columbus City Schools, the Boys and Girls Club, a new facility will be built in the middle of the hilltop, directly adjacent to Highland Elementary School and the J. Ashburn Boys and Girls Club. <laughs> this new facility will provide a high quality early learning education to more than 200 hilltop children and crucial programs and services for their families. This unique partnership will create an educational campus, allowing all three organizations to share space and resources and collaborate on important programs and services. What we do now in all of these areas paves the way for the future of this city for decades to 
come. And so, Columbus, I ask you to join me and to commit to helping advance change and help shape and secure the future of Columbus. I ask you to define the role you will play to help promote dynamic and inclusive growth. Will you organize your mosque, your synagogue, your church, your book club around high quality early learning opportunities, mixed income neighborhoods, affordable housing, to help strengthen and build our middle class where all Columbus residents have the opportunity to share in our prosperity. In a political climate where much is expected and promised by government, where challenges abound but our faith in elected leaders is fleeting, I ask you to stand with me to help chart our future together. Government alone cannot solve the problems we face. Our programs and investments in sound ideas alone are not enough to build strong neighborhoods. We need you. This is our chance, Columbus. The next 20 years may very well determine with a great amount of certainty the life of this community 100 years from now. This is our moment. This is our chance to grow and to lead. This is our moment. It is our time, right now, together. Thank you. God bless you, and God bless the city of Columbus. Thank you for attending the 2019 State of the City Address. Enjoy your evening.